Hi, so this is our introduction to our paper for poetry for Louise Glick, The Wild Iris. And so we're going to take just a couple minutes and we're going to go over um, some autobiograph or some biographical information about Louise Glick. We are going to talk about kind of her work in general. We're going to talk um, about some of her kind of major themes and thematic concerns and motifs that we'll see um, in this set of poetry. Um, and we will also talk about the wild iris itself as a text or as a collection of poems. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Louise Glick herself. So she was born in 1943. She died very recently in, um, in 2023, October 23rd, 2023. So she is actually one of our um, most modern, I think the most modern author that we have studied this year. Um, so she had what we would think of, I guess, as a much more um, quote unquote normal or traditional upbringing. Um, you can see here that she um, developed anorexia as a teenager. And I include this because it does have a bearing on her her education and her work moving forward. Um, she was hospitalized. She entered therapy and treatment. She did, she graduated from high school while she was in treatment. But after that, she chose not to enter college or university as um, a full-time degree-seeking student. Um, and instead, she stayed in treatment. She stayed in therapy. She focused on her recovery. Um, and you can see on there, we have a quote that says, I understood that at some point I was going to die. What I knew more vividly, more viscerally, was that I did not want to die. Um, and so that, I feel like, really encapsulates um, the decisions that she's making at that age in her life. Um, so in 1963, although, like I said, she's not like a full-time student, she's not taking courses, um, you know, as, as a degree-seeking student, she is taking poetry classes through Columbia University. And she studies under two very influential um, you American poets, uh, Leonie Adams and Stanley Kunitz. And so these are both previous U.S. poet laureates and um, Louise Glick studies with them and credits them, you know, throughout her career as mentors and major influences on her work. Um, she publishes her first collection of poetry in 1968. And after that, she supports herself as a full-time poet for the remainder of her life. Um, like I said, unlike a lot of the other artists that we study where there are these kind of like huge, major, like traumatic events, you know, or, um, you know, things that befall these people or things that they get themselves into, um, we would think of Louise Glick's life as a much more, I said this a, a minute ago, a much more quote unquote normal life. Um, she has some romantic entanglements. Um, she gets married, she gets divorced, she has a son, um, but her life, as we think of it, um, a little bit like Emily Dickinson, who, you know, was very much an introvert, stayed in her house. Like there's the, the action and the drama in her life a lot of times happens through her writing itself. Um, so just to kind of continue on that brief timeline, in 1984, she is asked to join the faculty of Williams College. Of course, she continues to publish while also working as a lecturer in their English department um, in 1993. The work that we're going to be looking at, The Wild Iris, um, actually wins a Pulitzer Prize. Um, and Glick herself, after studying under Adams and Kunitz as Poet Laureates, Glick herself is named Poet Laureate of the United States from 2003 to 2004. Um, after that, she is asked to be a writer in residence in, at, at Yale. Um, she is awarded a Nobel Prize in 2020. Um, and in 2023, she is appointed to the faculty at Stanford University. And unfortunately, in October of that year, she passes away from cancer. Um, as a whole, she leaves us 14 individual books of poetry, uh, two chapbooks, which are kind of smaller books of poetry. Think like a novella, you know, rather than writing a full-length novel. Um, two complete books of literary essays, so writing about poetry, and then a work of nonfiction, a novel as well. When we're thinking about Glick's style, um, sometimes some critics classify her as a confessional poet. That is actually like um, a critical term. Um, we're thinking people like Sylvia Plath, Ted Hughes. Um, she was learning poetry and practicing poetry at around the same time as these other poets. And so she's kind of um, lumped in with them. And also her work is deeply personal. At times it is autobiographical. The reason that it is not, she is not like fully considered a quote unquote confessional poet um, is because a lot of times she doesn't engage the audience in the same way as um, as other poets, especially these confessional poets do. Um, 
What's interesting to think about with Louise Glick is that her poems can be characterized by this idea of a lack, something that is not there rather than things that are there. Um, a lack of formal structure, a lack of sound devices like alliteration and rhyme and other sound devices like that, um, a lack in general of what we think of or what we would consider traditional poetic techniques. Um, a lot of times the words that you will hear used to describe her writing are spare, elegant, terse. Um, I found the um, description on the Nobel Prize page um, about Louise Glick, and it says, Glick's language is, clar is characterized by clarity and precision and is free of poetic formalities. She often uses daily spoken language. Um, and I think that is a really nice encapsulation of what you will find as you are reading these poems. So when we're thinking about The Wild Iris itself, this actual collection that we will be looking at, it was published in 1992. Again, it won the Pulitzer Prize in 1993. Um, as a whole, it has 54 poems. We are studying 30 of those poems. Um, things that you should know and as you like kind of go into your reading of this, of this kind of collection is that the poems have one of three speakers. So the speaker is either going to be um, the poet gardener the speaker might be a deity or the deity. It's really only one that is um, that is used as a speaker. Um, you can see here on the notes that I have God with an uppercase and then God with a lowercase because it is not necessarily specified whether we are talking about like um, a Christian God, whether we are talking about like you know, one of many in a pantheon of gods, whether we're talking about like nature or the earth itself. We don't know. It's just some sort of like higher power deity type person. That's one of the other speakers. The third speaker um, are the plants themselves. And what's interesting about that, we put that as like, oh, that's one other speaker, but it's not really just one other speaker because each plant has its own distinct voice. And so that's something to be aware of and something that we're gonna look at in just a moment. Um, the collection moves in chronological order through, quote unquote, a day in the garden. Um, and I put day in quotation marks because um, so I've seen it described as like an actual day. I've also seen it described as like a year being considered a day. So the timing is not necessarily um, precise there. Um, and also the poems as you have received them um, in your packet are, are in that same chronological order. So you are also reading them in order. The most specific time markers that we are given in these poems a lot of times correspond to Christian canonical prayer times, and you'll see this in the titles Matins and Vespers. And so Matins are morning prayers and Vespers are easy evening prayers. And so that's why you'll see the Matins poems um, at the beginning of the collection and the Vespers poems um, at the end of the collection. And so you can also think about the shift there and what that has to say about what's happening in those poems as related to the time of day. Um, something also to note about the Matins and Vesper prayers is that they are spoken by the poet gardener, so they have a specific speaker. And then all of the poems that have the plant names are spoken by that particular plant them itself, themselves, but yeah, it's spoken by the plant that is named in the title. And then you want to make sure that you pay attention to this, the major motifs and thematic concerns. Um, Louise Glick is a very, um, is an author that relies very heavily on allusion, both biblical and classical. Um, so being aware, of course, of biblical allusions, which is something that we're kind of used to, and also classical allusions. So we're thinking things like um, mythology, um, fables, that kind of stuff. Um, nature, of course, for this um, collection that is all about a garden, um, is is hugely important um and so all of the things that come along with that like i said the idea of cycles the idea of um you know thinking about the effect of nature on people and vice versa um part of that is death and rebirth and how we see that happening um because glick is um kind of working through a lot of this she is credited therapy and treatment um, that she underwent in her teens and into her 20s um, as a major part of her poetic process. Um, looking at the idea of loss and trauma um, is something that we will see in a way that is treated through um, this nature imagery. Um, she's also very concerned with the relationships, both familial and romantic, so paying attention to those relationships and the interplay. Um, 
Something that we should also note, we have, I have two quotes here, um, again, from the Nobel site where it says, Glick seeks out the universal. Um, and that is something that we see um, really through her use of nature, right? Nature is a universal. And so she is using this universal um, imagery and this universal framework to speak to particular experiences that are, you know, particular to her, but that because she is presenting to us in this universal way are also accessible to us as the audience. Um, also, another thing that is interesting and that kind of speaks to that accessibility of the audience to Glick's work, um, there is a quote from one of the forewords to one of her collections, and it says, Glick's writing most often evades ethnic identification, religious classification, or gendered affiliation. So again, that idea of her work, quote unquote, seeking out the universal, that is something that um, it seems that she strives to as a, to, to accomplish, right? This idea that her work um, can't be put into one of these boxes or can't be classified as simply one thing and not other things. She leaves herself open to this interpretation and open to the accessibility of the audience through her work. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the first poem in this collection. Um, it is actually the poem that the collection is named after, and it is The Wild Iris. Um, so just like we always move through a poem, the very first thing we're, gonna get, we're going to do is um, actually consider the title. Um, so when we're looking at this idea of the wild iris, um, the first thing we want to think about is like, this is one of our, well, this is one of our plant poems. And so we, um, we know already that the iris itself is the speaker. Um, one thing that we should know about an iris um, and that you should actually do for all of the poems that are you know, named by the plants is look up a little bit about them. You don't have to know a lot about them, but one of the things that is important for us to know about the iris is that the iris is um, a bulb plant. And so what this means is that it regenerates itself every year. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, replanted in order to grow. It just kind of does that every year. Um, and the other thing with our title is this idea of the wild iris. Um, they're making it, the, the author is making it very clear to us that this is not cultivated. Um, it is not done by human hands. So this like rebirth and regrowth just happens every year um, in, a, in a very natural um, and unforced kind of way. So focusing on that like natural kind of rebirth, regrowth. So when we're looking at this poem, um, we can see that it is broken into stanzas. However, just like we talked about in our intro, uh, Glick doesn't like to use a lot of those like very traditional like stanza structures or um, poetic structures or poetic forms or sound devices or anything like that. Um, so what we here and what we see um, is her, when we see these breaks, we need to consider what is happening with them. Why, why are they there? Um, and how can we group these or can we group these stanzas? So when we're looking at this, um, the very first line tells us this like first person point of view because we have that I. Oh dear person, POV. Um, and so it says at the end of my suffering, there was a door, which by the way is such a good opening. Those are such great opening lines. Um, and so we have this idea of this first person point of view. We know because we have already talked about it that this is the iris speaking to us. Um, and the thing that's interesting about this is that it implies to us as the audience, right? Um, that there is an end to suffering, right? And also this idea of a door, which is this idea of an exit, right? So this idea that suffering is not like, um, it's not eternal, it's not constant. And again, that speaks to this idea of like, you know, the cyclical nature of what we're thinking about. Um, our speaker then goes on to say, hear me out, that which you call death, I remember. So the speaker is telling us and emphasizing to us this like separation in their experiences. Because obviously that's something that we as humans are not going to remember, right? We are not going to remember death. Um, and the, our speaker, our Iris says, I do remember it, right? And that's because of this idea of regrowth. Um, so we're, we've got this kind of like introduction, this, um, this command even, right, to listen. 
Um, and then we switch a little bit. We switch perspectives. There is a, there's a shift here because it becomes a lot more descriptive. And we've got this imagery of like the noises, the branches of the pine shifting, and then nothing. The weak sun flickered over the dry surface. So where you've got this descriptive imagery of the earth itself. Um, and that's what we're looking at here. And notice these words that are used to describe this outside world, right? The weak sun, the dry surface. Um, so we have this like description. And then we shift back again to this um, kind of internal dialogue, or excuse me, this internal reflection. It's not dialogue. Nobody's speaking. Um, but the shift to this internal reflection where the iris, our speaker tells us, it is terrible to survive as consciousness buried in the dark earth. And so here she's got this personal reflection or this personal observation about this kind of moment of death, right? And she does, or our Iris does tell us, like, it's terrible. It is terrible to survive that. But also reveals to us, like, their idea of, like, consciousness. Um, and again, the earth is dark here. Kind of like we've got the weak sun, the dry surface, the dark earth. All of those pairs kind of um, illustrate to us what's happening. Um, we have another shift. We see that with the break. And then we also see it with this word then, right? Because that implies movement and implies movement of time. We have one thing, then we have another thing. Then it was over. That which you fear, being a soul and unable to speak, ending abruptly, right? That's kind of the it she is talking about. That thing which we fear, this idea. And then she expounds upon that, right? She tells us like, hey, this is, this is what you fear, you fear being a soul and unable to speak, right? So this lack of a voice. So um, after that, it says that that ends abruptly. And we start to see, again, we have this kind of um, really negatively connotated idea of the earth, right? The stiff earth bending a little. So we get to see that change in the earth because it starts to bend. Again, we see this movement. Um, and here, especially, we also see that shift kind of back to this description of what's happening, less reflection, more description, and what I took to be birds darting in low shrubs. So we have this change, we have this movement that's happening. Um, and again, movement in the natural world. And so again, we have another break, we have another kind of shift here. And we have our speaker again addressing us and again reflecting on this experience and reflecting on what they know now, right? And again, she's directly addressing us. You who do not remember passage from the other world, I tell you I could speak again. Hey, so now we have a voice, right? So we've got that connection here. She says, you fear this lack of a voice. She says, I tell you I could speak again. So when she comes back, she says, I could speak again. And so you, us, the audience, like, I know that you don't remember this. I know that you fear this, but she's reassuring. Our speaker is reflecting and also kind of reassuring us about this process. Whatever returns from oblivion returns to find a voice right? So this idea of not being able to speak, she's telling us that we don't have to fear that. And then we see kind of how that voice, quote unquote voice, how that is given to her and what that voice looks like. She says, from the center of my life came a great fountain, deep blue shadows on azure seawater. And so this final stanza is super interesting because again, we've had this like reflection and reassurance and now we're back to this like descriptive imagery. Um, and it's interesting because on the surface of it, what we seem to see is that we have, um, that she's talking about water, right? From the center of my life came, came a great fountain this idea of deep blue shadows on azure seawater. So it feels like it's imagery of water or of a fountain of the sea. So that's what we see as a literal thing. But as we think about that, right, she's talking about this coming from the center of her life, 
what is she? She is a plant bulb, right? Our speaker is the, the bulb of this wild iris. Um, so when she says from the center of my life, and also when we're thinking about rebirth, like how does a plant, how does a plant kind of get reborn? It grows again and it grows from this bulb. It grows from the seed. So from the center of my life came a great fountain, a blue kind of fountain. What does that sound like? This is a metaphorical description of the flower itself of an iris. And what's really interesting about this is she's talking about this is her voice, right? This is her idea of communication. And we know that because we have that colon, right? That colon shows us like returns to find a voice. Well, that colon shows us that she is going to give us a description of that voice, right? This great fountain, the deep blue shadows and azure seawater. If you actually look at a picture of an iris, you'll see kind of how apt that description is as well with the changing tones of blue within the flower itself. Um, and the other thing that's interesting here, as she uses that idea of like water, that imagery of water, um, think back to what is going on earlier in the poem. We have the weak sun and the dry surface, and now we have all of this kind of power, right? A great fountain that deep blue shadows on azure seawater. And so what we see there is this contrast between like the power of nature as she's showing us with her idea of that like voice slash fountain slash flower. Like, and that is coming from where? From the center of the flower itself from the center of my life. And it's showing us that idea of like internal, that's in, that says internal, <laughs> of internal power. Because again, this all happens because of that internal power. It doesn't happen because of the external stuff, right? The external stuff is weak, it's flickering, it's dry, um, it's dark. And then we have that contrast with that like, with all of that external weakness that I just showed you. So, weakness. Um, so that really shows us a couple things about what we can expect from this particular, um, from this particular collection, right? Because this is the first poem. This is our first poem in the collection. And so it establishes a lot of stuff for us. It opens with the plant voice it opens again with the idea of rebirth and resurrection. Like this is not a poem that is necessarily telling us, you know, oh, everything dies, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we return to the earth and that's it. This is a poem that is about, again, kind of coming back, kind of reclaiming and finding your voice. And this idea, again, this reassurance that that is what will happen. Um, and a lot of that is because it is reinforcing to us the, like, the cyclical nature of nature itself. And really, kind of expanding that outward, the cyclical nature of life. And also showing us, like, this idea of, the, like, the power of the internal to affect change. Again, none of that change, this voice, right? This power that doesn't come from, again, this external stuff, it comes from inside of the speaker themselves. And again, as a reminder though, I do want to, like this speaker is reassuring us like, hey, this is gonna be okay. We are going to see this. We are gonna see this reclamation of power. We are gonna see this rebirth. But we do have to remember that especially early in the poem, we get a lot of this my, you, I, you, a lot of that separation, like kind of that essential separation between um, the, between nature, right? Between our speaker, which, who is kind of representative of nature at this moment, um, and the um, poet gardener, who is our audience. Gardener, there we go. So again, as our first 
as our first poem, it establishes a lot of different and touches on a lot of the different kind of themes and notions that we will see throughout the collection. Um, again, I do want to remind you, if you are looking at one of these poems that has um, the title as one of the flowers or as one of the kind of like nature voices, definitely look up, I mean, a very quick Google will tell you all you need to know. You don't have to have in-depth botanical knowledge to be able to um, access kind of what's happening with these poems. But just knowing, like I said, in general, that an iris is a bulb plant that doesn't have to be like replanted um, in order to grow, like that's going to add to your understanding of this poem in a way um, that you wouldn't have before. Um, so making sure that you do that, like super general work to make sure that you actually get what's happening here. All right. Thanks very much.